Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to my, my session. Uh, I'm Jessica DeVita. As, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm a technology evangelist with Microsoft. Um, and our talk today is around automation and documentation and what, what are the limitations of those things? And what can you do um, you know, when you don't have either one of those things? Um, so just briefly, I will plug in my clicker, and then we will proceed. <laughs> Um, so, if for some re reason we haven't met, I would love to talk to you afterwards. I'll be at the Microsoft booth. Um, we can talk about DevOps culture. We can talk about anything that you'd like. Um, but if we haven't met, uh, I'm really happy to be here. It's my first ChefConf. It's my first time speaking at ChefConf. And it's been just nothing short of amazing so far. Um, so, I've spent about 18 years in IT, um, but before I was in IT, I worked in a uh, pediatric intensive care unit at Minneapolis Children's Hospital um, for about five years. I was also attending nursing school at that time, so I was kind of working towards a, a career in healthcare. Um, and so my experience in that uh, ICU fundamentally informed who I am as a technologist, and it taught me so much about empathy and just kindness and um, thinking about outcomes, patient outcomes, and working towards the same goal. Uh, so we've learned a lot in healthcare around um, communication patterns. Um, so I want to share with you a couple of pieces. Um, essentially, I want to talk to you about communication, uh, trust, teamwork, um, and how can we use tools and precise language and trust to uh, communicate and work towards clear goals. So I was a health unit coordinator, and this is a central, critical role in, um, in ICU. I'm at the front desk. I am transcribing orders from physicians. I'm being hollered at by nurses. Um, and all of that's coming in from um, essentially 20 patients. It's a 20, bed, uh, 20 beds in that unit. Um, and so it was a little bit of a high-stress job, uh, much like we have in IT. Um, I'd like you to think back to the last IT crisis that you had. Um, and if you feel so inclined, go ahead and close your eyes. And I want you to feel in your body the stress, the pain, the exhaustion, and some of the even burnout things that happen in these stressful environments. Um, and so we have errors, and we have system outages and, and crises. And how do we respond to those things? Um, and how can we use what I've learned in critical care medicine to sort of heal that and do that a little bit better? So I want to introduce you to some folks who uh, do that every day, um, that type of stress and pressure. That's the norm. It's, it's not the exception. It is the norm. But you know what's interesting about this is you don't see these folks bickering, do you? Um, you don't see them panicking. There's no panic. They're super calm uh, in a crisis. Um, and you do see them working together to save the patient, right? There's absolutely nothing uh, is happening that is not patient care related and patient care outcome. Um, working, working together as a team. So, Yesterday, Michael from Intuit talked to us, and he uh, was talking about health care a little bit. And he said, and I'll get this quote a little bit wrong, but, you know, the docs, the doctors and the nurses, like, they know what to do. Uh, they know where to go. They just do it. It happens. And if not, the patient dies. So I love that uh, he mentioned that and, and quote that. You know, so what, what is it that these people do? Right, that allows them to practice this effective communication uh, in times of crisis. Um, there's a lot of similarities between healthcare and IT. There's a lot of grouchy, angry, cranky people in technology and in nursing. Um, and in fact, my colleagues, I, before I went to the ICU, asked me, why the hell would you want to go work in the ICU? Those nurses will bite your head off. Um, and, it, and it's true, they were pretty angry a lot of times, but I think, um, you know, in that type of situation, it's almost like a, it's not quite hazing, but it's essentially how do they discover that they can trust you, that they can trust you that when the code blue happens, that you're going to be able to respond and do it quickly. Um, 
And I just loved it. I, I really thrived in that environment for some reason. Um, and in IT, we have strong opinions. You know, we all have unique experiences, backgrounds um, that all inform, and we have some very strong opinions. Same, same thing in healthcare. Our opinions, they differ. Uh, so three things, communications, trust, and teamwork. Those are the lessons learned. I'm going to dive into those a little bit here. Um, and, and why, right? Communication. Uh, because you can't automate everything. We, we know that. Um, we can't automate trust. We can't automate empathy. We can't do those things. Uh, systems can't help us with that. Um, so we need to learn how to talk to folks. You know, when you come to work every day, do you think to yourself, these are my people, these are my tribe? That's how I felt in ICU. I felt like all of those issues that we worked together, all of those patients over that five years, um, it, just, it just bonds you as a team. You know, when you go through something difficult like that at work, um, I think it helps you bond with your team. These are my people. I really felt uh, at home in, in that unit. It's just incredible to work with brilliant, talented, um, dedicated critical care physicians and cardiologists. So this is a little image of sort of like what the desk looks like, right? It's, it's just chaos in front of you. Um, and you can see that you're, you know, the beds are very close to the desk. There's monitoring, there's alerts happening, there's, you know, all sorts of uh, vital signs informing us um, the, you know, what, what are the patient needs at that point in time. Um, and there's one day in particular that stood out for me that I want to share a story about. And it was a typical day, um, a 14-hour shift, which is unfor unfortunately pretty common. Um, and so, you know, some of those things that where we're working too long, you know, we know our effectiveness drops after that time. Um, but in healthcare and in ICU, it was very common to have to work 14, 18-hour shifts. And every time we would get a... Um, patient out of the OR, uh, if it was a heart patient, uh, as most of them were, there was sort of like this standard set of orders that we would follow. Um, but this patient came out and was very, very sick, very unstable. Um, and so all of those sort of standard things that we do were kind of tossed out the window because there's just, the, the situation is changing too fast to be able to sort of rely on some of those standard things. Um, so your day could be going along, and all of a sudden, um, you're going to hear the code blue. Code blue, room 305. Okay, so when you hear that code blue, or paging Dr. Blue, sometimes it's called that, um, this entire team just like assembles out of, seems like thin air. We've got cardiologists, intensive care physicians, nursing, pharmacists, lab, hospice. Um, you know, how do we take care of the families during this time? And so these folks come together wherever the, uh, wherever the code blue is happening, and they perform life-saving measures to try to save that patient. Uh, as I mentioned, this baby was really sick. Um, I could tell that it was going to be a, a very difficult uh, shift with that patient. Um, and in addition to all the orders flying in really quickly, like all the orders from the doctors and constantly typing and updating and just doing everything I could to keep up, um, it was incredible. And then in addition to that, I also had to escort the family away from this code blue situation. Um, there's a lot of psychological harm that can happen when a family sees uh, some of the measures that we have to take uh, when a baby's very sick. And we want to protect them from that because it just, um, one, it creates space for the doctor to, to do the work that they do best. Um, and two, again, it's about protecting the family from seeing some things that would be um, really, really difficult to unsee. You know, it's... Um, anybody has kids in here, you can sort of understand what, you know, that might feel like. Um, so the patient comes out. The patient is on something called ECMO, um, which stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And essentially what we're doing in ECMO is we're doing the work of the heart outside of the patient's body. Um, and whenever a patient comes out on ECMO, it's usually not a good sign. It's, it's you know, that's an indication that there's something, you know, seriously wrong here. Um, and so what happened is the, um, you know, the child comes out, 
very unstable, on ECMO, and probably within about 15 minutes, um, it became very, very, very stressful because they had to turn my desk and like the patient bed right in front of me into an operating room. They had to reopen that patient right in the ICU. The ICU is not an operating room. There are all kinds of things that happen in an OR that create like, you know, um, things to protect from infections and things like that. We had to, on the fly, assemble an OR. I was pulling in walls, um, temporary walls, putting up signage so that the families would not come into that area and see what was happening. Um, getting, again, shouted orders from two different doctors and the nurses, plus the other patients that were actually still in that unit. And kind of just doing everything that I could to not be the constraint in that communication system. Um, again, there's verbal orders coming in. I'm typing, um, updating the, the patient record and ordering products. Um, remember this is 20 years ago. We really didn't have a lot of the systems that we have today. So, you know, this may seem archaic to you, but I would type in a little pager system, um, you know, 140 characters, something like that. Um, brief notes. These are lab results that are coming back. Whatever data that I need to quickly get to that, um, the, that healthcare staff, um, this is the system that I would use to, to get that data to them quickly, because they could be anywhere um, and get that, and then call back in with the corresponding order to help that patient. Um, so the lab requests would come in, they draw blood. Um, I would drop that into a tube system, shoot it up to uh, the lab, and uh, again, very quickly start to get those results back. 20 years ago, it's all paper. Everything's paper. All of the medical orders that I was typing in, that was really actually more about billing the patient for you know, whatever services were being done. It wasn't a really about medical records at that time. Uh, we were just on the cusp of sort of starting to implement some of those, those things. So you got massive, massive paper charts. And when a patient would come back from the OR, we would uh, have to order up all their charts from, you know, however many times that they've been there. And unfortunately, a lot of these patients lived in the ICU for the most, of, uh, for the most part. There was one little boy who um, had nine heart surgeries in, um, in the span of one year time. And uh, it was, you know, we got very close with these families. You know, they're there day in, day out with you. Uh, doctors are not good at writing orders. Um, a lot of this stuff is illegible. Um, so in five years, I had learned to, um, with each physician, how to interpret their handwriting. Um, and it's so critical, right? So these orders are about medication, might be important for those to be accurate. Um, so there's transcription that's happening, and then there's a secondary review to see if I got the orders uh, correct. Uh, everything's paper-based. This is evidence-based chaos. This is what the sort of working environment was like. Um, you know, again, bedside monitors, all of the, the lab reports coming back. But every patient is different. It's like all of your lovingly handcrafted artisanal snowflake servers, like every patient's a little snowflake server. Um, and these beautiful, beautiful babies, you know, six weeks old, heart surgery, and they just, I, we, we watched so many of them, you know, grow up and actually be able to leave the hospital. Um, it changed my life uh, working there. This is not the infant that, um, that was sick on that day, um, and unfortunately that was not a good outcome. We did lose that patient um, after three hours of open heart surgery right in front of my desk. Um, and I was very young at that time and had a young child at home, and it was incredibly emotional for me to um, both see that and support that and, uh, and have it not turn out well. But there were so many times when it did turn out well, so um, you, you, uh, you celebrate the, the victories. So what are the indicators of quality in healthcare, right? So this is just a sign like, um, you know, how many days has it been since our last central line infection? You know, things like that. Um, in IT, we talk about monitoring, and sometimes we're monitoring and measuring the wrong things. Um, and sometimes counting how long it's been since an accident has happened, right? We know from Sidney Decker's Field Guide to Human Error that um, that's not really a good indicator at all. It just means, okay, that 
nothing happened. It has no very little bearing that it wouldn't happen again tomorrow. But in this case, I think it's very helpful for the team to see what are we measuring, um, because days since last infection of a central line, that's a pretty good indicator that we're doing things right. We're doing safety, we're, we're incorporating safety, we're constantly improving our safety. Um, and again, everything in, uh, in, medical, in medicine is, is evidence-based. Um, so these are some good indicators. And I love this because I think it's important to celebrate the successes of your teams. So I don't know what your quality indicators might look like in IT, um, but see that they are helpful and informative and um, supportive of the successes that you do have. You know, I just think back to Jeff Hackard's talk last, last year at ChefConf. Um, you know, first, do no harm, right? The Hippocratic Oath, right? I don't know what the equivalent is in IT, but first, do no harm, right? Jeff's talking about building humane systems that um, inflict the minimum amount of pain. Um, you know, and how can we, uh, you know, make really intentional choices around the systems that we build. So communication, trust, and teamwork. Precise communication. Um, these are some of the things that I learned, right? Good communication in healthcare um, covers a couple topics. Who, you know, who needs the data at what time? Um, you know, is it accurate? Because if you send the wrong message, if I type a lab result to a doctor and it's wrong, and then an order is called in that a decision was made on that incorrect data, that's not going to be a, leading to a good patient outcome. So the accuracy is really, really critical. Um, Timeliness, right? So many times in IT, we are like writing these very long missives in email um, that contain too much data for us to process. You know, uh, you know, the human brain can sort of like only keep like, I don't know, 100 things or 400 things. I can't remember what the number is. Um, so messages that are coming in that are too early or too late, you know, could really um, not have a good effect on folks. Um, keeping folks informed uh, without o overburdening them with unnecessary information. Um, and the right folks having the information that they need at that time. Something we see in healthcare a lot is alert fatigue, and this maps directly to some of the issues that we face in monitoring our systems and in technology. Um, there's some research that shows that physicians disregard um, alerts that have to do with drug allergy interactions and things like that. But if everything's beeping, bing, the machine, right? It's alert fatigue. We have to start thinking about how we design systems um, and how you think that that person's going to respond when they see that alert. Um, very, very important to, as an industry to pay attention to alert fatigue. Um, effective communication. Uh, so this is coming from a blog on nursing care, but I took sort of uh, a little bit about this. Um, I'm going to try to go through this a little bit with you because I think it's so critical. Um, personal space, right? We talk and we're on the phone or however we're communicating, but when we're here and we're talking to each other, there's this personal space thing that, that happens. So if I'm a nurse, I'm going to have to touch you. i got to, like, fix your leg or whatever's going on, right? Um, and so that could possibly make you feel uncomfortable. Um, when I'm that close to you, there are sensory things happening. You can smell the person. You can, you know, you can hear them. It's hot. You can feel their body heat. This can be very, very threatening. Um, so a more safe distance um, is this sort of like personal space. So this is le less overwhelming, like one and a half feet. Um, so everybody do an exercise with me and put your arm out. This is a really good starting place for how close you should get to someone that you don't know and that you, know, that you haven't sort of established that more of an intimate sort of friendship or whatever that would allow you to sort of hug and get close. So keep this in mind just as an idea of a, of a safe, safe space to communicate with someone um, because they may not feel comfortable to tell you that they're, you're too close, um, but you could really, really upset people. Um, and we want people to feel safe, right? Uh, Safety is important. Here's a little visual indicator of what I'm talking about, right? The different levels of personal space. Um, so we're doing the public space thing where it's totally safe. It's, um, you know, one-to-many communications. Pay attention to this. I think 
in IT, we could do a better job of this, especially with our goals of, you know, trying to get more women in IT. You know, I'm not saying that this is a, a female issue at all. I'm just saying that people feel uh, unsafe if you get too close to them. And I know there's a cultural element, right? I know, um, you know, certain people from, from various parts of the world have a different idea of what's uh, like an okay space to be, you know, talking to someone. Um, and that's makes me super uncomfortable. <laughs> Um, so some other pieces are this idea of territory, right? And in IT, we see this a lot. We're like, I own this. This is my thing that I own. Um, you know, this idea that I own something, um, and I consider it mine. Roles and relationships, you know, who's your boss? What's the hierarchy? What's the reporting structure? Um, you know, timelines, as we start to think about postmortems post and things like that. Um, what are the events that precede and follow those interactions? Uh, the environment, we talked about com comfort and safety, um, equaling more effective communication and attitudes. Um, so I get really interested in this idea of uh, what happens in a, in a bad outcome when a patient passes away or when a, we have a, an IT crisis. Like, what's happening? Because we see at the top the event, but what we don't see is what's happening all the way underneath. Um, so again, in, in the Field Guide to Human Error, Sydney talks about this sharp end, like where the disaster happened. Um, and a lot of that research is coming from maritime and aviation disasters, um, where oftentimes the, the people who are at that sharp end of the, of the event are dead. You can't actually talk to them or learn from them. Um, and so I'm going to back up for a second. Um, so this is important, right? What is the larger systems view that we can see all the things that led to that outcome? So one of the things that is so cool, uh, if you are attended the SCALE conference down in LA a couple of weeks ago, um, you would learn that there's an incident command system. So this is used in natural disasters and fires and things like that. Um, and the key is this common communications plan, interoperable communications processes and architecture, all to support um, and give you unity of command, uh, common terminology, and management by objective. So this is the gentleman that gave that talk at scale, um, and I've been trying to find the recording of it. It's excellent. He maps uh, the incident communication system to managing an IT disaster crisis. Highly recommend uh, looking at how he did that and talks about that. You know, in nursing, there is no lone wolf. There's no, like, I'm going to be over here saving the patient. I don't need you. Um, we know that we have to work together, you know, whether we, um, that's our preference or not. Um, and do not be a, a member of this league, the trust no one league. This doesn't help us. Postmortems. Um, these are things that we do after uh, a bad outcome for a patient. And you know, my issue with postmortems in IT is that you guys are acting, and I say guys, and I, I'm sorry, um, we are often acting as if it's life and death, but it's not, okay? In, in, I, in healthcare, it is. So please stop treating these outages like someone's, you know, passed away or something like that. Like, you know, it's a very, very serious thing to, you know, sort of apply these same ideas. Because if you can have these blame-free postmortems, uh, it's just a much safer system. And furthermore, we have all these decision systems, right? And we have all the data, but then there's a point where, you know, you're you're automated. You've automated what you can. You've documented the rest, like all the nursing, all of that communications handwritten. Um, but there's a point where you have to make a decision, and none of that stuff is helping you. Um, and if you know that you're going to, uh, your decisions will be respected and instead of using them to fire you, uh, it's a much easier process to start learning from what happened. Um, yeah. These decision systems are very, very critical. Um, but again, they only get us so far. Um, all part of this larger idea of systems thinking and how can we see everything um, and define the boundaries to see what's going on in that system. So precise language is something we've talked about in IT. 
How many different names do we have for all these technology artifacts? Okay, droplet, VM, node, compute engine, um, machine, box, server, metal. How long do you think it's going to take a new person to come into your company and learn this stuff? Do you think this kind of naming convention makes it hard to learn? Makes it hard for a new person to come in? We have, we have a talent shortage in IT. We need to rethink our naming strategies. Um, this flies in the face of incident command to have all these different names. And I bet you have like a marketing department that just like, that's their job to come up with like new acronyms that only make sense in your unique situation. Um, we've got to work for a more uh, precise communication and use common language. Um, I think we need to think about that in IT a lot. Uh, another thing on communication tools, um, email's really bad. I am, I'm really bad at it. I'm, I'm terrible, and I think most of us are terrible at email. Um, you don't see a doctor, like, emailing a nurse when he needs, like, you know, surgical sponges. There's no political posturing. There's no bickering. There's none of those things. Um, and they most certainly do not use email. Um, and if in uh, two weeks, if you're going to be at Lean UX in New York, I have a modest proposal for how to do email better that I think will kind of revolutionize these things. In IT, we need trust. We need clear goals. We need to be working towards the same outcome. Um, you know, in medicine, we all know that we're working to save that patient. Um, in IT, we have a trust problem. Uh, Jez Humble talks about this pathological organization. Um, and I've worked in some of these places, and it's toxic. It feels terrible. You walk in, and you just feel how awful it is. And that is like, tan it's like tangible culture, and there's something really wrong there. Um, and in healthcare, it's generally speaking a generative environment. Um, and, you know, things, failure, uh, are merit inquiry and learning. On trust, like, how do we hire people in IT? Do you think it's, we're good at that? Um, I think we hire a lot of skill sets um, and then try to, you know, we've got this role and we've got these things that we think they're going to be responsible for, and then we go out and try to find somebody who fits in that box. Um, I think it would be good to reverse that a little bit and hire good people first. And what I mean by good people is, you know, do they care? Do they show you that they want to work work collaboratively in that team. Um, it's really important to protect your culture and understand that people are going to bring their culture with them. And, and if they're coming in and it's a super toxic environment, that's going to break that person. They're going to leave. Um, and so I, I think it's really important to think about, rethink our hiring practices. You know, in nursing, we spend a lot of time looking at their background, background checks, uh, things like that. Uh, so the whole point of this is, um, you know, we can lose people at any time. And I think if we pay a little more attention to, um, to that, I think some things could possibly change. Um, you know, being able to just say, you know, I might not see you again. Like, doesn't that change the way we're going to interact? I'm going to care for you and, and show you all the kindness in the world. Because um, everything can always be lost. Um, I wrote this talk um, a couple months ago, and I just want to um, briefly uh, share a memory of Carlo Flores, who was a huge part of the LA DevOps community. He passed away uh, two days before the SCALE conference. Um, devastating, devastating loss. Um, the burnout that happens in healthcare and in IT is a systemic issue that I think we can learn from both industries and try to uh, make improvements there. Um, I don't want to lose one more sysadmin friend, uh, not another one. Stop asking for permission to do something that's going to improve the outcome for your patient, for your customer, for that server, for your colleague. Just do it. Um, and take a chance. Uh, be willing to fail. Thank you very much.
So we have a little bit of time for questions. Question related to burnout. In your experience in the medical field, what techniques do they use to keep people from shutting down in the middle of an emergency, from being so overwhelmed with the amount of information coming in? That's something I've seen in IT a lot, that they just shut down completely. Uh, can you speak a little to that? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we monitor that. So we, we pay attention to our colleagues and coworkers, and if they show signs of exhibiting um, extreme stress, or they're not responding in the way that you would think is typical or that is uh, un untypical for that person, um, we take measures. We talk to them. We take them out for a walk. We take them out for coffee. Obviously not in this type of crisis. Um, and that actually very rarely happens. In five years, I never saw anyone lose it and just shut down. Um, but I, I recognize that that happens in IT. And I think we can start looking at like, you know, work in progress and how much are we putting on folks uh, that they feel like they don't have any control over their outcomes. That's what leads to burnout. Question? So that question was around, um, you know, recognizing when a team, when a colleague or a team member is in trouble um, and they're, you know, not, they're not with it. There's something going on with them. So you talked about um, hiring good people versus skill sets, but mm -hmm. what do you propose or how do you, why would you propose to like interview for that or, or like kind of discover that uh, when you're, you mm -hmm. know, basically dealing with lots of people like asking for jobs and you just don't really know and the only way that you can really quantify if they're good or bad is based on can they do something or not. Right. Well, so in IT and technology and especially software development, I think there's this idea that we can test and find the fake engineer. You know, there was an article, there was a blog post a couple weeks ago about, you know, let's, let's, I'm, I'm going to catch that guy, I'm going to catch him. He didn't know what, you know, something like that. So. I think the way we screen people um, needs some help. Um, we can do, you know, more behavioral types of, uh, you know, questioning and things like that. Um, but in terms of actual practical go-dos, um, I would say start spending time in meetups. Go to where the people who do the things that you need doing hang out, and spend time there. Um, you know, a beautiful example is the LA DevOps community. Um, Every, me every single meeting, there's recruiters and folks looking for work because you know we have this talent shortage right now. So just go there, meet them in a neutral place, and get, uh, I think you'll get a better sense of who they are and you know, see how they interact with you and, and things like that. Of course, you know, we need to do some pair programming sessions. Of course, we need to do some whiteboarding, some architecture stuff to try to like, understand, can you work with this person? You know, are they going to you know, dive in and start to, um, to work on stuff right away? I don't know if that helped. Did that? Okay. We can talk more after if you'd like. Any more questions? I think we're good. Thank you, everybody. This was fun. I appreciate you hanging out. Thanks.